Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm Geraldine Duke, and uh, I'm to be your MC for tonight. And in welcoming you, we acknowledge first the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, on whose traditional land we're gathered, and their elders past and present, uh, the custodians of this land. I'd like to welcome Her Excellency the Governor, Marie Bashir, Professor John Yu, uh, representatives of our host tonight, the George, uh, members of the board uh, of the Institute sitting down in front of us, distinguished guests, welcome one and all to this wonderful occasion in which we uh, pull off, I think anyway, a, a type of classy Australian trifecta, if I can put it like that. We're going to acknowledge the lifelong contribution of one of our really treasured applied scientists and clinicians, Professor John Yu. We're going to welcome another similarly committed and distinguished and constructive representative uh, from the world of medicine and public service from our near neighbour Singapore, Professor Tan Chor Shuan. And we're going to consciously and explicitly wrestle, this is what I like, about with the very contemporary challenges of health and wealth in the Asian region, our own neighbourhood, which of course to many eyes we have neglected here in Australia, yet which offers us so very, very much if we do engage. I, I happen to be personally incredibly committed to this and I try to include it in as much of my journalism uh, as, as I can on my radio program and I must confess to being slightly bewildered, to be perfectly frank, that there aren't more events like this um, which hang up their shingle quite obviously and say, we want to talk about our neighbourhood. We want to talk about the real possibilities of enmeshing with it. We don't want to gild the lily. We know there are dilemmas. Uh, we want to talk about the good, the bad, the ugly of true engagement. And I would think that the type of agenda of tonight that tonight represents is music to the ears of people like Ken Henry and others who are up to their eyeballs right now in uh, writing the white paper for the government on engaging with the Asian century, which I personally think will come to be seen as one of the truly creative ventures of this government. Not that it's necessarily going to make it up to the tr press galleries <laughs> list right away, but uh, these things take time to percolate, which is exactly the role of a, of a good white paper. But it does make the George's decision to hold this, uh, stage this inaugural oration so incredibly timely. And it's such a pleasure to have been invited to MC this event to offer, to honour Professor Yu's career, which has so straddled Asia and Australia in, um, and has been devoted to promoting a range of relationships in different realms. And I think we'll hear from Professor Tan very shortly on some similar styles. Uh, um, and I think we'll, we'll also be conducting a Q&A for about half an hour between him and the George's principal, Dr. Stephen McMahon, after which I'll invite the governor to present the John New Medal to him. So we're aiming to wrap up formal proceedings around about 7.30, so this is not a, a marathon event. And then I do hope that you will stay and enjoy some refreshments and uh, very good company. But for a formal welcome, and to introduce us more to the wonderful work of the George, could I now introduce the George's chairman, Michael Hawker, to uh, come to the stage and tell us some more. Michael. Thank you very much, Geraldine, and uh, Your Excellency, Governor, Marie Bashir. It's wonderful to have you here, and thank you very much for spending your time. It's wonderful to see you to uh, Dr John Yu and tremendous that you're being honoured in this way and um, you know, thank you for your wonderful contribution both to the, the George Institute but many other activities in Australian life. My, the purpose of my role this evening is uh, threefold. Firstly, just to say a little bit about the George and, uh, and I want to just read something about the George. You saw some film about it. The George Institute is one of the world's leading uh, global, uh, world's leading research institutes conducting projects on a global scale. It develops healthcare solutions that are accessible and affordable. It saves lives by tackling the world's leading causes of death and disability. Its approach to public health puts people first and explores the best way to provide services that support healthy living. And you've seen some examples on the film here. It's another one which has become very public not long ago in Australia called Food Switch, which is an application that that's on your mobile phone, which you can look at um, barcoding of 
packaged goods and it'll give you a traffic light indicator on whether it's high in fat or salt or sugar. So it gives you some indication of what you're eating. And that's just one of the myriad of, of many things that we do to try and make healthcare more affordable, more affordable and usable. We're, we are a medical research institute. We're associated with the four universities of Sydney, Hyderabad, Peking and Oxford. They're founded by Professors Steve McMahon and Robin Norton sitting in the front seat here and you'll see both of them this evening. We're 14 years young and we were last year ranked the number one medical research institute in the world of 3,000 that were measured for effectiveness in um, medical research. So we don't provide the most but we're regarded as the most efficient in what we provide and the most effective in what we provide which is not bad for an Australian originated medical research institute. My second purpose is that like all medical research institutes, it's a philanthropic organisation, so I will put the philanthropic plug in here. So this is, is an evening to raise awareness. I'm not, I don't, I'm not holding out the bag to take some money off you to walk out the door. That's not important. It's more about raising awareness with eminent Australians, of which you all are. And, and you may be interested in helping the institute, or you may even know of someone who is. And unlike most uh, medical research institutes, raising money for us is difficult. Uh, because we don't have an emotional appeal. What we really need is seed funding for innovation. As the film said, there are 7 billion people in the world and only 2 billion are able to access good medical care. So George is providing basic and affordable medical solutions for the other 5 billion. That's what we're trying to do. And this is about changing practice and policy. And hence our appeal to people like yourselves to understand the leverage and legacy that comes from changing policy. So that's the second message I'd like to provide. And my third message is that it's one to enjoy yourself this evening. It's one of learning something. And I hope that uh, you'll uh, f find the oration of interest. And if you're able to stay afterwards, there are a number of very eminent medical research people in the audience uh, who you may want to have a chat with. And there are a couple here. It just happens to coincide with our quadrennial meeting of our Research and Development Advisory Committee. And we've got f five very eminent professors here, uh, three from overseas. We've got two from Australia, Professor Terry Dwyer, who chairs that, who's the current chair of the Murdoch Children's Medical Research Institute in, in Victoria. We've got uh, Professor Gary Jennings, who's just the past chair of the Baker IDI Institute and also the um, past chair of the Australian uh, Association, Association of Australian Medical Research Institutes. We've got Professor Mike Merson from America, who's the chair, founding chair of the Centre of Global Health from Duke University. We've got uh, Professor Wang Haiyang, who's a very eminent nephrologist from uh, China and uh, the University of uh, Peking University. And of course, Professor Tan Chua Chuan, who we'll hear about later on. So I hope you have an interesting evening and thank you very much for coming. And I'll pass over to Robin to introduce the next part of the affairs. Thank you. Good evening and thank you Mike and welcome Your Excellency and of course John Yu um, and indeed our other guests that we have here tonight. It's my pleasure to firstly outline to you the reasons why we have initiated tonight's event, the inaugural John Yu Oration and Medal Ceremony and secondly to outline the reasons for our decision to invite Professor Tan uh, to be the initial recipient of the medal. As many of you will be aware, uh, Dr. John Yu chaired the board of the George Institute for five years from 2006 to 2011, immediately preceding Mike Hawker's appointment and following Peter Burrow's appointment as our initial chair. John's contributions in that role were immense, but of particular significance, especially for this evening, was his support of the George Institute's endeavours to work in Asia with a major focus on improving the health and health care of individuals in that region. John was particularly supportive of our plans to establish the inst Institute offices in both China and India. And when we formally launched the George Institute in Beijing and the George Institute in Hyderabad, Early in his chairmanship, John played a key role 
in both of those events. Arguably, John's passion for engagement with Asia was only eclipsed by his passion for Australia. And so our efforts to encourage greater engagement between Australia and Asia, Asian staff, not surprisingly, was very well received by John. In wanting to recognise John's contributions to the Institute, we thought it entirely fitting that we should do so by awarding a medal to an individual who was likewise passionate about health improvements in Asia and maybe had a connection with Australia. I first met Professor Tan about a year ago when we both attended the World Economic Forum meeting in China. Professor Tan was chairing the session in which I was speaking and we easily connected, given our mutual interests in how best to provide health care for the many people in the world who currently do not have access to safe, effective and affordable care. And indeed, the need to find innovative solutions to address those concerns. When I left the meeting, I uh, googled Professor Tan, tried to find out some more about him, and it became very clear that his background, his current role, and his ambitions were very much aligned with those of the Institute. And so, for the senior staff and the board, it was very clear to us that what Professor Tam was all about was something that was what we wanted at the Institute. So our first stop was to invite him to become a member of our Research and Development Advisory Committee, and that gave him an immediate connection to Australia and the George Institute. So on that basis, as we were determining who might be the best recipient of the inaugural John Yu Oration and Medal, it was obvious to us that Professor Tan was the right choice. It is now my pleasure to invite Geraldine to formally introduce you to Professor Tan and to tell you a little bit about his background before inviting him to give the inaugural John Yu Oration. Well, thank you, Robin. And, um, when you hear about Professor Tan's schedule, you'll wonder how he fits the George in, but he does, I'm delighted to say. Um, look, what I think is good about this oration, if I may say, is that it's, it, it embodies regional ties, but it pinpoints the business of commitment to mutual development and friendship, which was very much part of Professor Yu. And I, I have a firm belief that much of the problem about the lack of interaction between the sort of broader bulk of Australians and um, the Asian region is that so much of it has been abstract thus far, very abstract connections, very much about trade and diplomacy and military ties and so on, whereas the people contacts have been somewhat kept in as a bit of a guilty secret, really, I, I think, between some people have amazing people-to-people -people contacts, but they don't shout from the rooftops about them. And they're not the sort of thing that um, the Daily Telegraph picks up and says, yeah, well, we're really making progress here. And until we do have that, I feel that we won't. We will stay in our, our little corrals. So we're about to meet, I think, someone who really breaks through that type of um, uh, closed door. A fascinating product of his community tonight, who, like John, has such a range of commitments that um, I did wonder whether his real research achievement is in alchemy, that he manufactures a few extra hours each day <laughs> to fit in his um, considerable skills as a physician. But his belief, quite obviously to me, that it's well-run and designed systems that truly make a difference to people's lives. And he's applied his formidable array of talents towards that complex aim. Professor Tan Chor Chuan's day job strictly speaking, is president of the National University of Singapore, its leading university. But he also serves as chairman of the board of the National University Health System. He's also deputy chair of Singapore's Agency for Science, Technology and Research. And he's senior advisor to the governing board of the Duke NUS Graduate Medical School. 
He's been a key driver in Singapore's Biomedical Sciences Initiative since its inception 12 years ago, and he's been widely acknowledged with various medals by his country, I'm delighted to say, um, for his public service, going right back to the Singapore Youth Award back in 1996, when he must have been but a stripling. He's been a member of the World Economic Forum, as Robbins suggested, Global University Leaders Forum for the past four years. He's also currently chair of the International Alliance of Research Universities. Probably many of you know this, but it's a consortium of 10 leading research intensive universities. He's a renal physician by training and is a fellow of the Royal Colleges of Physicians of Edinburgh, London, here in Australia, also in the US, and an elected fellow of the Polish Academy of Medicine. And I noticed on the CV, he was a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society of the UK. So I said to him, what's that all about? And he confessed that uh, it was well spotted. He said, I'm, he's a backpacker and uh, traveler. And he, had, he was invited by another backpacker, nominated for this auspicious uh, body, which of course is people like Shackleton and Scott, have uh, graced uh, its doors, and he's extremely proud of the fact that he is a member, he is a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society of the UK. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are welcoming a very broad, diverse individual tonight. I'm absolutely delighted and ask you to give a very Australian welcome to Professor Tan tonight to deliver the inaugural John Muir oration on the topic, Shaping Asia's Health and Wealth in the 21st Century. Professor Tan. Good evening. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Geraldine and Robin, for those uh, very warm and kind words. Your Excellency, the Governor of New South Wales, Dr. John Yu, the Senior Leadership of the George Institute, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I, I do really mean it when I say that I'm deeply humbled to be invited to deliver the inaugural John Yu oration. Do Dr. John Yu is, uh, in the words of uh, Phillips Adams, the former chair of the Australia National Day Council, I quote, a remarkable and compassionate man who has dedicated his life to saving and improving the lives of the nation's children, unquote. John, of course, made numerous contributions, remarkable and distinguished contributions to healthcare, not just in Australia, but also in many other parts of the world. And I was particularly delighted to learn from John that this included a significant Singapore component, particularly in the 1970s. And as we've heard from uh, Robin, under John's chairmanship from 2006 to 2010, the George Institute scaled new heights in the impact of its research and active leadership in global health. It is uh, today recognized as uh, one of the preeminent centers for research impact in its field and uh, when I received the invitation to serve on this advisory board, I was very happy and honored to accept. It is therefore a special privilege for me to make this presentation in honor of Dr. Yu, to celebrate his many accomplishments. And I'm also very grateful to uh, Michael Hawks, uh, Hawker, uh, Stephen McMahon, and Robin Norton and the George Institute for this signal honor. As many of you know, the 21st century is widely referred to as the Asian century, reflecting Asia's dramatic economic growth and rising prominence on the world stage. And within this context, the transformation of healthcare represents at once Asia's greatest, one of Asia's greatest challenges, as well as one of its greatest opportunities. When one thinks about the challenges of uh, Asia in the healthcare arena, the challenges are profound and many. But let me just highlight a small number. First, uh, as we all know, Asia is remarkably heterogeneous. The countries of Asia encompass many political systems, are at very different stages of development, their health status and priorities are different, and uh, it makes it very difficult and very challenging for someone like me to make comments tonight which will draw together threads that extend to most of the countries of Asia. 
But what is quite clear is that there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all approach or solution for the challenges of Asia. We'll have to tailor them to meet the specific needs and priorities. So we are very familiar with the heterogeneity of Asia, so I'll just illustrate here with just one set of data. If you look at countries like Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, their GDP per capita is around $1,300. And if you compare it with the high income countries of Asia, uh, Japan is uh, nearly 40 times higher. And because of this, the total health expenditure per capita in countries like Laos is about $40, whereas it's 100 times more in Japan. Now, we should also remember that Asia encompasses several extremely large countries, notably China, India, and Indonesia, and that within these large geographies, there are wide regional differences in the healthcare priorities, status, and systems. So, for example, if you look at life expectancy at the year 2000, uh, cities like Shanghai or Beijing have a life expectancy somewhat similar to high-income countries like Singapore and Korea, whereas country, uh, provinces like Inner Mongolia and six other provinces have life expectancies which are more similar to Philippines, Thailand, and Indonesia. So the differences within regions of these large countries is as large as the differences between countries within Asia. Now, Asia is not just very heterogeneous, it's also in the midst of a truly massive and accelerated change. And this change is extremely complex because health and social and economic development interact in very complex ways. And I like to refer to this as the tangled web of health. Uh, it's actually possible to try to map the interconnections between all the different factors and the causes and the effects across different areas of health. And a colleague of mine sent me this uh, chart a couple of years ago. It's a simplified representation <laughs> of the factors affecting obesity. So I thought tonight I should not attempt to reproduce this. I really would not like to test your hospitality. And therefore, I offer you a very simple schematic, which I think illustrates some of the key points about the tangled web of health in Asia. So if one thinks about rapid economic growth in Asia in the context of globalization, one of the things that is driving is urbanization. Urbanization at a pace and scale <coughs> unprecedented in human history. And together with economic growth and urbanization, we see very rapid social changes in lifestyles, in diet, in education, in marriage, in the structure of families, in many aspects of society. Rapid economic growth often leads to widening income gaps and inequalities in all countries, including those of Asia, and unfortunately often occurs at the expense of environmental protection. So pollution, occupational diseases, accidents are a consequence of this. So the interaction of all these different factors result in a number of very significant transitions. Transitions in which are demographic, which are nutritional, which are epidemiological, and also healthcare and health system transitions. So let me explain a little bit about what I mean. I want to just start maybe by talking about the demographic transition. And here, the things which are most pertinent are low fertility rates in large countries, really rapid rural to urban migration, and the aging of populations. And if you look at uh, fertility rates in many parts of Asia, the most important issue is that they are dropping remarkably quickly. So several countries in Asia, uh, notably Japan, China, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, and Thailand, have fertility rates which are substantially below the replacement. And only a few countries have total fertility rates which are greater than three. In addition to this, several countries in Asia are also aging rapidly. So this chart here shows the percentage of a population above 65 years of age. And the blue bars show current data, and the red bars show the projected percentages in the year 2025. And you can see that in China, 
in Singapore and in Japan, uh, we are all going to face a very dramatic increase in the percentages of the elderly. And this is the same case too in Korea, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. So Asia is in this, in the midst of this really historical, historically unprecedented demographic transition. It is also, as many of us are aware, in the midst of a nutritional transition, a transition from the high carbohydrate, low fat diets, which used to be the pattern in the past, to diets which are very familiar to us, uh, which unfortunately many of us enjoy, high uh, total fat, high cholesterol, high sugars, high refined carbohydrates, which together with the sedentary lifestyles brought about by urbanized uh, kind of living is fueling a, a true epidemic of obesity throughout all countries in Asia. Now, all these things uh, add up to what we call an epidemiological transition. That is the burden of non-communicable diseases such as diabetes, high blood pressure and so on is high and is rising in all countries in Asia. But in developing countries, this is occurring against the backdrop of an existing high burden of communicable diseases. So a double whammy. And just in case you're not depressed enough, we also all face the threat of infectious diseases of epidemic potential, bird flu, SARS. And uh, we also, Asia is cited as one of the likely sources where the next epidemic agent will arise. So the epidemiological transition we see imposes a triple disease burden, particularly on developing countries which lack the capacity to cope with it. So let me just show you uh, some of the impact of non-communicable diseases such as diabetes and high blood pressure on the countries in Asia. So if you look at a measure of the burden of disease, uh, you will see that uh, in low and middle income countries in Asia like Laos and China, in fact, the burden of disease due to non-communicable diseases is higher than that of infectious diseases. So many of us have this notion that communicable diseases are the most common causes of burden of disease in these low income countries, but in fact, it's been outstripped by non-communicable diseases. And of course, the burden of non-communicable diseases in these countries is higher than the high income countries in Asia. If you look at mortality, and here I show you some data from Southeast Asia, you'll see the same trend. The red bars show mortality from infectious diseases. And here, as you might predict, uh, countries like Laos and Cambodia have the highest mortality rates for infectious diseases. But take note of the blue bar, which is the mortality from non-communicable diseases. And here, it's quite interesting to see that they actually make up a higher proportion of the mortality even in the developing countries of Asia. So non-communicable diseases are a really significant issue for the healthcare systems of these countries. And just to make matters a little bit worse, uh, things are actually going to further decline because, as this chart shows, there's a correlation between the prevalence of diabetes and the wealth of a country here shown in terms of per capita income. So if you look at uh, high-income countries, Singapore and Brunei, we have the highest prevalence of diabetes. Intermediate countries like Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, and Malaysia have an intermediate prevalence. And the poorer countries like Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam have the lowest prevalence of diabetes. But as these countries get richer, the prevalence of these diseases, <coughs> diabetes and non-communicable diseases, will be expected to rise further, compounding the problems that they will face. So Asia is heterogeneous. It's uh, in the midst of the massive accelerated change I tried to outline. And this has resulted in several major driving forces which have very significant implications for our health systems. I tried to summarize these uh, concisely by the drivers in high-income countries like Japan, Australia, Singapore, and in the low- and mid-income countries of Asia. 
And I think the, the bottom line I want to say is that the driving forces conspire to drive up the demand for healthcare today and in the future. So I mentioned the high burden of non-communicable diseases. In the poorer countries, there's already a high burden of communicable diseases. Rapid aging is a problem in high-income countries, but also a significant problem for mid-income countries like China. In high-income countries, overconsumption of healthcare tends to drive up demand. And in the poorer countries, the healthcare systems are catching up. They're catching up in terms of service provision. More patients are thankfully getting access to healthcare. And then, of course, affluence, education, and rising expectations, all these things are going to drive up uh, the demand for healthcare. But we cannot just look at the demand side of it. Even on the supply side, which is the providers, the hospitals, the clinics, there are things which are conspiring to drive up supply side increases and pressures on the health system. So high technology, uh, expensive drugs are already very important drivers on the supply side increases in, in, in developed countries. Of course, health financing and payment systems are very critical in determining supply side of the equation. And I want to also particularly stress uh, the importance of healthcare workforce specialization on supply side uh, demand. But let me just maybe touch briefly about the financial systems because this has got a very important influence on the way demand and supply, supply induced demand uh, proceeds. It's uh, difficult to make statements that will apply for the whole of Asia, but I think one thing you can say is that the financing systems are very diverse across Asia. Everything from predominantly tax-based systems, like you see in Hong Kong, to social insurance-based systems, to countries where high out-of-pocket payments are necessary. Generally, there's a, a movement towards universal coverage, uh, having the majority of the population having access to essential healthcare. This was led by Thailand, but was now uh, attempts are being made in Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, and India. And overall, in most countries, private expenditure is rising faster compared with public expenditure. Now, every country has got different kinds of finance, health financing strategies. And here I'll just briefly mention uh, the view from Singapore. Not because uh, we have a superior system, it's just that I know the system better. And the Singapore financing system uh, has a strong focus on instilling personal and family responsibility for health. So this is a fundamental tenet which underlies our policy formulation and implementation. And uh, its expression in practical terms is cost sharing. In other words, uh, every time you consume healthcare, you pay for a small portion of it. Then because Singapore is aging so rapidly, we are trying our best to ensure future sustainability. In other words, can each generation try to pay for its own health? And the, this hopefully would reduce intergenerational types of problems. Now, the mechanism by which that occurs is through savings, which in Singapore, there are compulsory savings schemes, and of course, there are voluntary saving. And then we try, like everybody else, to provide uh, high quality care with good access, and uh, we make use of insurance and also government subsidies, except that in our case, we try to target the subsidies, particularly to the most needy in the community. Now, these strategies play out in a complex way in the actual delivery of the financing, but I'll just uh, summarize it here by saying on the patient side of the, of the, of the, side of the chart, uh, cost sharing is a very uh, important factor, and uh, the government introduced means testing a few years ago as a way to more effectively target subsidies to those who needed it most. Now, we have to be very careful about the supply side. I, I don't know whether there are any CEOs of hospitals uh, or clinics here, uh, but we all know that how we fund the, the providers drive their behaviors uh, in, in very, very powerfully. And uh, in Singapore, we try to strike a balance between funding the providers adequately 
so that they can maintain quality and access, but to try to prevent the risk of over-servicing, churning volume, doing more procedures than is required. Now, this is very difficult to manage, but we try to make use of uh, a mix of what is called DRG funding, which is by activity, you are paid per activity, with a global budget. There are some common activities for which you are only given a certain budget, and uh, even if you did more, uh, you will not get additional reimbursement. And we are also very careful in looking at what we fund, uh, what is covered, what are covered services, what kind of services are eligible for fees, because these create a whole set of incentives that can drive provider behavior either in the right way or from the system point of view in the wrong direction. Now in 2005, a, a World Bank research paper studied uh, the financing systems of Japan and the four Asian tigers. And while it studied the systems, uh, uh, the stu system studied varied tremendously from uh, tax finance systems in Hong Kong to social insurance-based systems in Japan, Korea, and J Taiwan to Singapore's rather unusual health financing system. Uh, one of the conclusions was that it appeared that all types of financing systems can be adapted to keep health spending in check while maintaining reasonable quality. And there is no right or wrong financing mix from the point of view of macroeconomic expenditure control. In other words, uh, it's not the system per se, but how you tweak the system in order to balance quality with excessive consumption. And uh, the paper makes the very important point that every country has to learn from each other, to study what they're doing, and continually tweak what they're doing. I want to move from health financing to make a short but very important point on the issue of healthcare worker specialization. And uh, here is uh, the main point I want to make is that in most developed healthcare systems, labor productivity gains in healthcare have been stagnant or falling for several years. And this rather complicated chart uh, illustrates this for the US. So please concentrate on this horizontal yellow bar. The healthcare sector in the US grew uh, between 1990 to 2010, but this shows labor productivity growth. It's actually negative. So as the sector grew, actually, uh, it ha its labor productivity fell. And uh, this is in stark contrast to the rest of the US economy and to the manufacturing sector, the retail sector, financing sector. In every sector, when it grew, labor productiv productivity actually improved, except for health. Now, the importance of this observation for Asia is a very simple one. If Asia just followed in the models of the developed health systems today, if we just adopted current models, then there simply won't be enough trained personnel to meet the rising demand. Where would all those trained people come from? So we should bear this in mind as we think about the challenges of, uh, of uh, which Asia faces in transforming its healthcare. I think it's actually not too difficult to enumerate all the different challenges. But I think we should also look beyond them and see whether, in fact, within these challenges, the transformation of health of Asia represents one of its greatest opportunities. If we put it another way, the question could be, as rapidly emerging Asian countries grow economically, how should they best invest the additional resources into health? How would they get the best outcomes for these additional resources? And when we talk about this, uh, my friends from WHO remind me that strengthening health systems is a very complex process. And uh, we should refer to the WHO's framework for action, which is about how you actually, the different building blocks you need to put in place to strengthen the health system. So uh, adequate service delivery, a well-trained health workforce, uh, appropriate information systems, availability of medical products, adequate financing, leadership and governance. So there's a comprehensive framework about 
by which you, you need to apply to strengthen your health system. But I will not uh, go through this comprehensively today. I would just want to highlight a number of potential areas where Asia could try to leapfrog uh, its health system development. The first suggestion I have is for Asia to give a very high priority to health promotion and disease prevention. This actually sounds very self-evident because every health system would proudly claim that it's already doing this. But we do know that uh, given all the different pressing priorities that health systems face day to day, most of the time you're running around with fire extinguishers in hand, that uh, promotion of health and disease prevention inadvertently can slip back in the priority of things. And this is compounded by the fact that the attitude of many policy makers is conditioned by a certain view of the healthcare system. So most healthcare systems were developed around what is called clinical medicine, the treatment of disease in individual patients. Uh, this patient has this disease, we treat this patient. Now, this is quite understandable because of the historical evolution of health systems and also because of the spectacular improvements in clinical medicine. But if you are faced with a situation where there's going to be a massive increase in non-communicable diseases like diabetes, high blood pressure, and in some countries with the existing burden of communicable diseases, these are predictably going to lead to similarly massive increases in the burden of disease and advanced disease with the health system would have to cope with. So the question is, how is the health system ever going to be able to cope with this tidal wave of additional disease? Now, I think the, we must uh, think, I think, beyond just the clinical medicine model to a model which is more based on public health. Clinical medicine focuses on the treatment of the individual patient. Public health looks at the health of the entire population of the community. And within that concept, we want to put a lot of attention on health promotion and disease prevention. There's a lot to be talked about in terms of health promotion and disease prevention, but here I just want to say that I personally believe that one of the most important areas that we have to focus on when we want to have promotion of health and disease prevention is about behavior, human behavior because human behavior underlies the majority of these diseases. And so we have to think about how we can shift human behaviors to more healthy ones. It can be done at the level of the individual, community, and uh, I would say healthcare provider in a somewhat different context. But first, at the level of individual, a lot of the interventions today is about educating the patient, giving information. But a lot of the research shows that, in fact, that's of uh, little or modest benefit. So in other words, just educating someone about the risk of diabetes does not usually lead to a sustained change in behavior. And uh, Mato and his colleagues uh, wrote a fascinating, fascinating paper in Science that proposes that, in fact, interventions targeted at what they call automatic behavior uh, would be more effective. And I, if you like, we can talk about this during Q&A. But it's also very important that uh, we not just think about trying to change the behavior of individuals one at a time. We should focus on that, but we should also consider whether we can shift the behavior norms for whole communities. And this will require a much more comprehensive framework that includes education, public policy, laws, economic and financial incentives. And the best example of this is actually cigarette smoking. In cigarette smoking, we educate the public, we put high taxes on tobacco, we prohibit advertisements, we prohibit smoking in public spaces, and the consequence of all that is, in fact, in many communities, you have a shift in the social norms towards ones which are against smoking. So what one hopes is that we'll be able to do this more systematically for the risk factors for com non communicable diseases. And finally, I just want to also make the point uh, I made earlier that the way we incentivize or not incentivize healthcare providers 
through the way we finance them, through, through social activism, also sh changes the behavior of these providers. And it is possible to incentivize them to pay more attention to health promotion and disease prevention. The second uh, suggestion I have is that going beyond disease prevention, we should pilot new delivery models and particularly ones that focus on human capital innovation and technology. How to look after more patients effectively but using a smaller number of highly specialized staff. And here I must say that the, the George is doing superb work in this area, is a real leader in this field, and I think it's a very important area to further expand. I go back to this mental model of our healthcare system, and it'll be fair to say that for many healthcare systems, the center of gravity of the healthcare system is closer to the tertiary hospital end of the, of the spectrum, uh, which is about treating advanced disease. Uh, this is characterized by high complexity, high variability in the patient course. You, uh, you need a lot of high-tech medicine, and therefore you need a lot of highly trained specialists and subspecialists. So this is high-tech medicine, advanced medicine is appropriate. But we all know that the majority of patients in our hospitals, at least in the countries I know, and certainly the case in Singapore, the majority of the patients are actually what I call non-complex. Uh, they have diabetes, high blood pressure, maybe a little bit of heart problems, maybe a, a touch of renal disease, but they are not complex cases. What they would really benefit from is having evidence-based care consistently delivered and monitored meticulously over long periods of time. That's what they need. And you probably don't need highly trained subspecialists or even specialists to do that. So the question we have is, therefore, when you have this huge epidemic of non-communicable diseases, many of which are non-complex, are there new models of care delivery which will be much more effective, which will be more convenient for patients, and which will be less demanding on the health care workforce. And there could be several potential approaches to achieving this. Uh, one which is particularly a hot topic today, we spoke about it at our advisory board meeting, is called mobile medicine, making use of handphones and other forms of modern communications to uh, look after patients, to inform them, to educate them. And uh, WHO recently did a, a very comprehensive survey of the mobile medicine field, and uh, it concludes that uh, mobile health has uh, many applications uh, for healthcare delivery, uh, including trying to improve treatment compliance, especially for patients with uh, diabetes, lung disease, chronic heart failure, or you can use it to uh, monitor patients health status, whether for communicable or non-communicable diseases. But it also acknowledged that many barriers still exist. Uh, M-Health, mobile health, has not been widely adopted by most countries. And the reason for that is that relative to the pressing problems that every health system has to deal with, the cost effectiveness of these initiatives, the M-Health initiatives, is still not established. And uh, there aren't really any large-scale deployments where mobile health is integrated into the overall way we look after patients. So it's very hard to say what the business case is, whether it's effective, whether it's cost effective. And finally, if you're going to do mobile patient monitoring, you actually need diagnostic sensor technology that can be deployed freely, that is sufficiently low cost to make it economically viable. So there are many impediments to the widespread adoption of mHealth in health systems. But therein also lies a great opportunity for Asia. As Asia develops its health systems, does it need to go the way of the advanced healthcare treatment and then start to do mobile health? Or could it go straight to mobile healthcare for the non-complex patients? I think that would be one possible leapfrogging opportunity for Asia. And intrinsic in that will be research, which uh, the George is uh, a fine exemplar of, and also the education and training 
of future generations of policymakers and healthcare workers to think differently about the models in which healthcare can be delivered. And finally, I think uh, underpinning all leapfrogging initiatives is research. And here I want to particularly stress, in my view, the importance of research which is relevant to Asia. There are uh, interesting data to suggest that uh, in several important diseases, the cause of the disease, the response to treatment, differ in Asian populations as compared with Caucasian populations. So you cannot just take uh, studies done in Caucasians and extrapolate them to Asians. In fact, we need to develop research which will enable us to uh, refine clinical approaches and treatments which are specific and relevant to Asian populations. And here I just give you a very quick example from my own institution. Uh, we lead a, the Singapore Gastric Cancer Consortium. Stomach cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death worldwide, kills about 700,000 people every year. It's common in Singapore, it's common in East Asia. And what the consortium has done has been to identify clinical and blood markers which allows it to say amongst a population of people which are the ones at highest risk of developing stomach cancer. And then those high-risk individuals are invited to enter into a surveillance program which involves annual endoscopy. And uh, they have been following up this 3,000 high-risk patients and so far they've detected 17 patients with either stage zero cancer and a couple with stage one stomach cancer. And in order to do that, they've also needed to develop new tools. So they have uh, new types of microscopes using Raman spectroscopy, confocal microscopy, uh, fancy devices that allow you to look underneath the surface of the stomach lining at cancers which are, we have not broken through the surface yet and which will not be visible just through ordinary endoscopes. So using these new types of imaging which they've developed, you can detect these cancers very early, cut them out using the endoscope and uh, achieve cure without surgery. So in conclusion, I would say that uh, shaping the health and wealth of Asia in the 21st century uh, will represent clearly one of Asia's greatest challenges. The heterogeneity is massive, rapid change, and the many complex driving forces, which uh, amongst other things will lead to rapidly rising demand. But at the same time, I think we should consider that this is also a great opportunity, a great opportunity for us to find new ways of improving health, but in much more cost-effective ways. And uh, I believe that this should encompass a focus on health promotion and prevention, the piloting and study and extension of new delivery models, as well as relevant research that will define the characteristics, the response to treatments specific to Asia, and also for health system innovation for Asia. And in, and in this regard, I think uh, I've been really so impressed uh, during these last two days, uh, hearing the many presentations from researchers in George Institute. Uh, they are doing cutting edge work. Uh, some of it is early, some of it is already having an impact, but I have no doubt that it will contribute very substantially to the transformation of health in Asia in the 21st century. So with that, uh, it's such an honor for me to be able to give this inaugural John Yu oration. Thank you so much indeed for the honor. Professor Tan, that was absolutely fantastic, really a marvellous overview, just so provoking at so many levels. And I'm going to make an executive decision, because we are running late, that I may cut short our Q&A to enable uh, um, Her Excellency to come up and present a medal, and then for us to have time for fun, as Michael Hawker <laughs> said. Uh, so, where to start? I think what I might do is actually ask Stephen, given Professor Tan's wonderful overview, uh, seeing things so outside the box, I wonder what your response is in terms of where uh, research in Australia might assist, or in effect is this leading us in ways that we haven't 
dared thus far go? Because I can see many challenges to doctors' notions of themselves, let alone patients, and I wonder how you'd respond, please. Well, I, th I, think, um, I think probably the, the answer is that, um, and, and, it, and Professor Tan alluded to this, yeah, we can't take the Australian health system, um, a remarkable entity though it is, uh, and place that in any Asian country, uh, largely because it's not affordable in Australia, and it's certainly not affordable in most, most of Asia. I mean, in Australia, the, the, um, uh, the cost of health care continues to expand um, at a rate much higher than um, GDP, and the consequence, of course, is that if this continues, the government, the tax take, will only pay for health care and nothing else. So we, we do have a serious problem in this country in terms of sustaining the sort of super specialist type health care that we have. Uh, I think the other, the other important um, issue in this country is also uh, that of rural and remote populations who have significantly worse health care, significantly worse outcomes, and that's most uh, obvious in the indigenous community. And we clearly have a health system that is failing significant parts of the country. And in a sense, that is what much of Asia shares as well. It has a health, well, the little health systems in some of the large countries like, uh, like Indonesia uh, fails a large part of the population. And so I think that both countries have a lot to learn in terms of uh, strategies that might provide much better care to, to those who need it at a cost which is um, sustainable. Could I add a point? Do. I, I think also it's a, a very interesting and important question and that um, we also can learn a lot from the developing countries because this is one situation where they will be able to introduce many things which will be much harder to do in a very well developed and mature mm. health system mm. uh, just simply because they don't <coughs> have all the baggage, uh, the labor practices uh, and so on. And so this is one situation where by working the, with the developing countries we can, can actually learn a lot which might be applicable back in our own countries. And so the George, for example, with uh, centers in India and China is well placed to do these kind of comparative studies and it might end up with a bi-directional flow of thinking, technologies and ideas and not just a unidirectional flow. Do you know, I want to agree with you, but I wonder <laughs> whether <coughs> pre-existing expectations and politics would simply intervene. I mean, really, mm. this is, uh, th this, well, if I hear you correctly, you're talking about much more focus on primary health care, are you? Is, is yep. that correct? Yes. Uh, yes. And, and this non-complex. Different, yeah, different types of care. Uh, look, I, I, th I think, um, I think the, the solution to um, health care anywhere it has to be comprehensive. Uh, at the end of the day, we can't ignore that expensive advanced medical end of things because um, there are now already too many people on the planet with the diseases that mm. are going to cause those complications. So we have to find a way to deal with that. But I would absolutely agree with Professor Tam that the we need to greatly shift the center of gravity away from that focus on the end stage, the, you know, the few percent of our lives that we will spend in hospital and think about health in the much uh, broader lifespan. Uh, both at primary care but also at the community level. You've got this interesting phrase, uh, Stephen, uh, the need for frugal innovation. Yes. Now, I want you to develop that. What do you mean? Well, I, I think uh, medicine, like many uh, sort of technical um, professions, has grown and expanded over many decades through uh, extremely expensive innovation. So it's typically been the, the biggest, shiniest new um, uh, equipment. Uh, the most um, specialist, highly trained doctors, and the consequence has been uh, an enormous um, escalation of costs. And the U.S. is the the worst or the best example of that, um, where you know things like primary health care have almost disappeared. That people go straight to a specialist in the U.S. And so the cost of health care is 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 phenomenal. And once again, if if high-income countries are going to uh, provide health care for all of, particularly the elderly, rapidly growing elderly population. And if middle and low-income countries are going to provide health care at all, 
we have to have a completely different model. And we use the word frugal innovation because we need completely innovative ways of delivering care. We need innovative ways of developing healthcare products. But it has to be based on the, on the notion of affordability. And some people talk about extreme affordability. And that really is what the world requires. It requires extreme affordability. If we think of healthcare, at least a basic level of healthcare, as being a human right, we can't have a system uh, that uh, involves healthcare costing so many thousands of dollars as it does today in this country. So if I asked you both, the, you say, Stephen, in some of your work, and I want to see what, what, what Professor Town thinks, that the largest challenge will probably be political, but consumers and existing providers, yes. <laughs> which I presume quite a few of the people who are here, um, how would you propose, and then I'll ask Professor Tan, who's dealing with them a different way, how would you propose to change that conversation to those two groups? Well, I guess the George Institute's approach and the role that we see ourselves taking is one, to help um, facilitate the, the development of innovative ideas, but then to evaluate them robustly. Because clearly, if, for example, we were saying that we want to replace um, care for diabetes, uh, instead of everyone having to see a doctor every three months or six months, but perhaps see a health technologist um, equipped with a, with a smartphone. Um, the response to that from, dare I say it, the Ameri uh, Australian Medical Association of Light will be that it will be a dangerous thing to do. Mm -hmm. So we have to provide the evidence that says if we do this, actually we get good quality outcomes and it's safe. And that could come from Asia, I suppose. If Absolutely, that's your whole and point. that's exactly yeah. the point, yes. And I think uh, the, the key point is that uh, going cheaper does not mean worse care. I think uh, what we have to hold constant is quality of care. Exactly. But, so we can, have to, uh, but can you, honestly? Exactly, so, so we, the challenge that we want to put into our research <coughs> is provide that same or even better quality of care, maybe at higher convenience, but at a more affordable cost. And the way to persuade everybody is through evidence. Yeah. So we need to run these pilots, we need to study them rigorously, we need to be able to demonstrate to everybody mm -hmm. that you can indeed achieve this. And this will be a fundamental step before you can have widespread acceptance. Can I, can I be really difficult here and say, what yeah. if you can't achieve it? Then we look for innovative ways. Uh, so, so this is not gonna be a, a one-off challenge because there are so many different things that uh, you know, one could look at, uh, heart failure, treatment, lung disease. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna, be, uh, and it's gonna be a period of time where uh, you need to do a lot of work and uh, you'll find some successes. Uh, there are already some successes uh, in other fields we could talk about. Um, and uh, there'll be some failures, uh, but the general direction, uh, I think needs to go in this way. Uh, this is gonna be a, a long-term effort. It's mm -hmm. not gonna be immediate. But I, I think one needs to be challenged constantly to think yeah. innovatively about uh, new ways of doing this, keeping quality while making it more affordable. Stephen? Well, I think the other aspect is that um, there have to be choices made about the health care that any country can afford or provide. And I think there is, in many places, possibly Australia, probably Singapore as well, an expectation that there is no limit to the care that the insurers or the, the government or whomever's paying for it will provide. But of course there has to be, because it can't be limitless. And I think that requires a new dialogue with the community about what it values, where it wants to see the money go, does it want to see the money go to schools, or does it want to see the money go to community health, or does it want to see the money going to um, uh, intensive care units. You know, there have to be there has to be dialogue about these decisions because the truth is that no country can afford all of this all of the time. We thought the mining tax discussion was difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this really does <clears throat> take the cake. Um, I just I must. I was intrigued by that graph you showed, Professor Tan, of the um, labour productivity in the U.S. That was a fascinating graph. <laughs> Quite uh, what. What do you put that down to? And I mean, obviously, that is not a model that you can follow. How, how do you propose to avert that problem? Well, it's complicated. And uh, actually, the, the reference is uh, New England Journal of Medicine in 2011. It's a very nice opinion piece. Uh, it didn't really go into the details of uh, why the productivity did not grow. 
but uh, one can imagine firstly, you know, not just numbers, greater numbers of uh, health specialists, but also administrators, you know, people who do your payments and so on, uh, you know, the, the whole bureaucracy. And uh, I think it's a sobering point for us to note uh, because uh, not, it's not just only about money, it's all about also about human resource. And today, uh, we, make, we try to make, um, fill up the shortfalls in our own uh, specialized labor needs by uh, importing healthcare workers from other countries. But as uh, the developing countries of the world become more affluent, uh, they too will need these healthcare workers. Yes, sure. And if all of us are having the same model, then where will all the healthcare workers come from? And if you take it one step further and think that your, your population is also aging very rapidly, where are all the caretakers going to come from? So, so I think it's something we need to reflect more upon. Uh, the causes of labor productivity, growth or lack of it in different countries will differ very greatly. But I, I think it's something which uh, maybe has not come so much to the fore of consciousness, but I, I think it's going to be a very important factor for the future. Look, final question to you both, just being conscious of the time. So you're really describing this a very, as far as I can hear, a very interesting public health model a and a new one to be thought through a complete new conversation in the professions, let alone the public, let alone the, uh, in, in the world of politics. I just, I just wonder how long you think that's going to take to percolate even into your professional associations. I mean, is this the sort of conversation that, that you have when you go to your peak bodies and your uh, specialty meetings that I haven't heard much talk about this from friends of mine, but I'd be very keen to know how long you think, who's going to lead this conversation is really what I'm asking. Mm. First to you, Professor Tan. Well, uh, um, so I may have got my facts wrong, but the time when um, it was first shown that smoking was dangerous for health mm. to the time it was widely accepted and measures were taken, I think it was about 30 or 40 years. Right, it took about 40 years. <laughs> Uh, mm. when, when Doll and Peto That's first showed right. that smoking was bad for your health, nobody believed them. And it took 40 years to, to fully implement it. I hope we won't need 40 years with this, uh, but I think we have to be prepared for the long haul uh, because, it's, as I said, there's no, not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution. Uh, we still have to deal with the things, the pressing priorities of today. Uh, we still have to tailor it for the situations of different countries. But I think in the general direction of the way we think about these things, uh, we, I believe we need to factor more of these types of longer-term considerations into our policy and our planning. Stephen? Um, well, I think if we, if we left things as they were, it will take potentially um, several decades uh, to see change. Um, I think with 100 million people dying every 10 years below the age of 60, from conditions that are entirely preventable, um, I, I don't think we can afford to let it take its own course. I, I think we, there is a degree of activism required now to say that actually this is not acceptable. We have the tools. We, kn we know what to do. We it just comes need a question of equity, though, doesn't yes. it? Massive question of equity, uh, health equity. Absolutely, it does. Mm. Um, and, uh, and I think um, you know the world is changing, that uh, the poor in the world uh, uh, have the capacity through modern communications to understand that they're not getting mm. care, mm. that they're not being looked after, and it's definitely the case that um, I in many countries it's the security issue, the fear that there will be uprisings if people don't get the care that is going to drive things. And uh, you know, I, I think one of the things that the George ne is um, it needs to be an agent for change to push the agenda faster. Uh, because I think, uh, you know, the numbers of lives at stake here are, are uh, uh, enormous um, and uh, really uh, it, it's, it would be a different matter if we really didn't know how to save these people, but we know exactly what to do and it can be done cheaply. Uh, we just have to come up with innovative ways to actually get care to those who need it uh, and that's, that's the big challenge. Well, gentlemen, it's certainly um, a very noble challenge and very well articulated. And uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, thank you both, Professor Tan and uh, uh, Stephen McMahon. Would you care to thank in the usual way? And
very much uh, like to uh, call on Dr. John, John Yu to join Professor Marie Bashir on stage. Uh, um, Her Excellency, if you join us to say a few words about uh, the presentation of the medal. Thank and you. I will hand over to you. Thank you, Geraldine. Well, indeed, it's a deeply felt honour to stand here before you in such illustrious company of colleagues, so many who've contributed greatly uh, to our nation, and particularly to thank you, Professor Tan, for accepting the invitation of that most illustrious, wonderful organisation, the George Institute, which honours Dr John Yu today, and certainly there are few people amongst our medical profession despite his modesty, who's brought more luster to the, the profession, certainly in my lifetime, and I'm sure all who know him here would agree. It's not only been in the field of paediatrics, in wonderful administrative skill, uh, but also in the arts, and adding, I believe, to the quality of life in our nation. John's contribution has been absolutely outstanding. I can say this as someone who had the great privilege of working at the Children's Hospital and also encountering his work in many, many ways. And of course, one of the things that we'll remember him for was the move of the Children's Hospital to Westmead when he ensured that there'd be superb art, living art, with which the children could interact and that too had a healing quality. So an exceptional Australian and I feel it's an honour to stand here on behalf of the George Institute and may I thank you Michael Hawker too, whom of course I've known for many, many years and thank also the directors of the George Institute, Professors McMahon and Norton and all who work with you for your contribution we can say to the world. One of the questions I would have liked to ask you both <laughs> is how early can we start that health education intervention? I would say in preschool years. <laughs> Indeed. 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 Indeed, across yeah, the right. world. Indeed. Well, thank you again, and Indeed. may I? On behalf of the George Institute, present you with this medal, which I'm a very great Australian. Thank you very much, uh, Joel, and, and uh, as a, um, can I just thank you all for coming? It's been a, a, a very auspicious day for us at the George. Can I just also say that uh, many of you probably know the ABC program is self-improvement Thursday. This was self-improvement Wednesday from our point of view. So this is a, giving the opportunity to see another part of the economy. And I think it's very interesting, the whole debate about uh, health provision. And as you can see, it's, a, it's an enormous challenge globally. And a lot of us spend our time in different fields and you never have any idea what's going on in the field of health. And I thought that was a very, very timely and useful education on what's going on in health, uh, both here and internationally. So can I also thank uh, your Excellency, the, the Governor, for being here this evening, and John Yu, and for everyone else. Thank you very much.